Yahweh, and thank you for the invite. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I apologize. It's it's exam time at university. Emil's a professor as well, and we're like struggling because we're running exams online <laughs> and coming here. So I wish I could stay here to hear all the presentations, but it's a busy time. We're also in a strike, so we lost all our help, which means we got to do all the work as professors. Um, so apologies to those that I missed. I would have loved to have stayed for the two days. Um, having said that, I am from Six Nations of the Grand River, and I am Mohawk, Wolf Clan. Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I did my PhD work with the Cree from Northern Alberta, the Lubicon. Um, I wrote a book about it, and I try to stay in touch, and I'm going to present some of the findings from um, Little Buffalo, but I'll go over the whole project. And then Emil came out, um, our computer scientist who's developing the sensors with the elders in the community. Um, and it's been a bit of a struggle. COVID shut us down for two years to do field work, so we, we had to adapt and shift and um, got really um, proficient in making prezzies and, pre and, and publishing. We published a lot. Um, of our research findings. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go over the whole project, and this isn't even really all of it, because there's three, or really four, but I'm only the PI of three. Um, so what we do in our project is we kind of have two ways to communicate. This is the work we do for community uh, to explain who we are, what we're about, and how we came to be. Um, so who we are. Um, and and the, this panel isn't here, obviously, but there's uh, myself as the lead, and then, of course, this won't work. Nidhi Nagata is from the United Nations University, so we do governance, and we've used the great law to make wa uh, water law for Haudenosaunee people, um, and we're still working on that. Dr. Bev Jacobs, who is the provost of the University of Windsor, is my partner on the governance. Denise McQueen is a student who does a lot of the Mohawk translations for us because everything is bilingual that we do. Chris Martin is a teacher with the STEAM Academy and he's done a phenomenal job in helping us accredit all the high school students from our community so that by the time they're done with the project they have produced digital stories, they have made maps with us, GIS mapping and um, stories. So I'm going to share some of their work. Sarah Smith is also a student, but from Six Nations, and she's the epidemiologist. So we're doing the data sovereignty, collecting our data, and we found out that along Six Nations, uh, the Grand River Conservation Authority had never put down sensors. So we're like, I couldn't find baseline data for us. So I said, okay, we need to uh, fix that, and we're gonna upload our sensors that Emil's gonna be talking to you about. Um, and and people will be able to look in real time on a map how the water is doing, whether it's from their well, river, or creek. And the idea is to keep them low cost. And Makasha spoke yesterday, and she's leading some of the um, governance issues at the United Nations for us. We've sent a lot of our young women to the UN, and from there they got invited all over the world. So I think the next place they're going is Paris to a climate change summit. So building capacity for our young women, at, I'm from Six Nations, so it's young women, um, is very important to, to my work because we need leaders and we need to help them in every way conceivable because they are inheriting a bit of a mess. So we have to do what we can to train them, to get them proficient, and to exert our sovereignty over our lands and our waters. Um, we always start, and the whole project is built around ganyo hanyo. So this is something our children do every single day, every morning. They do it when they leave school. It's on our radio stations at 6 o'clock in the morning. We start by giving thanks. That is part of our culture and who we are. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not a prayer. It's literally acknowledging all of life and making sure you understand how precious it is. So it is a part of who we are. So we built the entire project around the Gagnon Hanyo. And they're also called the words that come before all else. So one of my students who's brilliant um, made a digital story and I'm gonna share it. Oh. 
I don't know what I did. <laughs> Sorry. Let's try again. All right, there we go. Negative <laughs> Yat you reoge, Zinuzi, I tino for a dosse, Uriho Aguego, as it are Aguego Yunhe. Negri, Cadihuni, Sego Yagunhe, and Ungue soon, I got to John Jade. Nezi, it tiquenasta, Uriho Aguego, Zina Hori Yunhe. Aguego Yanat Kawahajan and Guayat Dairi Staka. Nungri eight to eight noe, and Zito were dirty what they hunt her. Nino for the donor donko, ne gano or a donser. Do you re again? Tino for a lado. Jujurata, a gway goods in over the Gayan digits, never got to Joko Jade. Gahni Gardunio, a gway gona for the eto Gundido, a wange. Neoni of Hunjagi, a gway gona for the Yuduni, a gway go do yento. A gway gona Gundido, a gway gona zita agua, was a good donna of Hunjagi. Negri ne, eight to eight no, aguego, what it no more than you. So we had it at Caruniade. Nay, Radiwano Dajets, Gaidi Nigawerage, it is Sutta, a Sutta Naka, when it Dajets, it's the Watsir or Scarnagate, or the Swatera. Negri ne only day, you just stock Quadunia, the new Yuguayagato. Negri eight only, what it no more than you. Dahno. De un chiardo, and you tell you what Negat say, Nene, I un chiata nostade, got the job on Jade. Sawiero, ne, Sungoya Dizu, Rauha Oni, Zinuzi, the Holy Cano, Jovon Jade, ne Oni zit Caroniade, and Nungoya da Yiristaqua, the Tsiduan Horado, the Etogadino Doge, Nanagua Nigora. And do go ten on a hoodie, the Gadi Hook, that say, he's going his way at that songs of what got when I got over a dozen of the eight on a gown on a on a eight. So that's Frank, and he's also been helping us with our virtual reality. When I asked the um, chiefs and clan mothers how to give this findings because some of it is distressing, it's not a good situation with um, climate change that we did, the study. Um, we also did, you know, water testing, and it's not great. And I didn't want to um, create more anxiety. We also did a health study with the birthing center. Um, the midwives conducted it with a PhD student. We also did it with Six Nations Health Services. Um, another PhD student did that, uh, Sarah Dugnan. So we tried to understand the impact that not having access to clean water has on the daily lives of uh, the community, and we. The findings are a little bit distressful, but health services is responding um, to those uh, findings. So what we did is we created a virtual reality, and I was shocked. I have never made one before in my life, nor did I ever think I would at 60 years old. But here I am, making a VR. So if you want to try it, it's back there. <laughs> um, I do say it starts in Sky World. There's a little bit of a fall. Um, don't panic. It'll be over quickly. Um, but it's, it's an amazing experience. And we just went out to Silicon Valley and had a bunch of experts that made Roblox and Minecraft, and they said this is amazing. So kudos to the Mohawk team that's been working with that and the elders that have been helping us put it all together. So we had a really fancy graph that the engineers made me because we have an engineering team, and it, it freaked out our community. So I said, OK, let's put that same information in pictographs, which is traditional to my people, and the turtle central to our culture. So we now have all of our uh, 10 teams and 10 research projects rolled up underwater in this Haudenosaunee framework. And we use digital art uh, for that. 
So water governance, as I mentioned, is major to the whole project. It's pervasive from every team that works with us. And part of governance is knowing and having knowledge of your waterways, understanding what are the issues, what's happening, what do you need to do to clean it up or restore it back to health. So getting this data was very important because many of our people do not have access to the data. Secondly, it's the advocacy work. So in our case, we chose to, um, I just went on Facebook and said, who would like to go to the UN? Um, there's a leadership program, we'll enroll you in it and we'll help fund it. And a bunch of young, brilliant ladies applied and off they went. And, and their careers are now quite set. So, so um, this is Makasha, she um, did the opening and she also created a digital story. And it helps them connect with other First Nations, Indigenous people worldwide. So they get a sense that there is a network that they can work with. And they've continued to work with um, all of these amazing young people from around the world. So part of our project was also about knowledge mobilization. It's, I mean, we, like I said, we've published, we have about 12 academic peer-reviewed scholarly journals um, that we've published in, climate change books. Um, we've, we, we've done our, our scholarly piece, but for me, the harder and more important piece is making sure the community has access to this information in a way that's meaningful and that they can understand. So knowledge mobilization <laughs> it works through the youth. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, Norma will shoot me, but I have to skip over Norma. She, she, this was done specifically for Global Water Futures, which is why I'm skipping it over. This is what they asked for. Um, she'll shoot me. So groundwater um, is what Norma and all the Grandmother's Council that we put together to oversee our project wanted to identify as the most important resource. And of course, the United Nations folks on our team agreed. Um, no groundwater should be touched. It, it's a non-renewable resource. Uh, by 2050, we are going to be running out of water. Yes, even in Canada, is going to be water insecure. So to be giving away our groundwater to these companies for extraction um, is, is highly problematic, and it's an issue, thank goodness. Our clan mothers, faith keepers with Makasha have decided to, to target, including Nestle. And they mounted an, an extraordinarily successful campaign against Nestle. And we also used social media during COVID because we couldn't communicate with our, our community. So Makasha, because she's my daughter and I could say, hey, you're gonna do a podcast. Um, and then I would get Emil and everybody on our team to come on, but of course people aren't gonna tune in, no offense, Emil. Um, to computer science talks. Um, so we would bring really amazing young people who are doing amazing things around the world, and we would bring people in, and then we would kind of sneak the science in there. So it worked really well, and it won the David Suzuki um, Knowledge uh, Ground Up Award. So we do a lot of work around sustainability, um, and our main priority for our team is to highlight that wi water is governed by women. Um, that's a majority of cultures that we work with um, also uh, see women as governing water and we need to work harder to exert our sovereignty, especially with the clan mothers um, and use the United Nations in any way we can to advocate and conserve and manage our waterways. We've published in a this in a book called uh, Climate Change. We also published um, Haudenosaunee Women's Water Law Restoring the Sacred, and that is in Sui's uh, text, Indigenous Water and Drought Management in a Changing World. If all of these are listed on our website, um, which is, we're very active in. I'm not gonna go over the United Nations because I know we're kind of running out of time, so I, I can't. But basically, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals identified that water needs to be a priority, indigenous ecological knowledge. But of course, this is something they tried to destroy for the last hundred years, and now they want it, and our people are like, um, no. So we're very particular about what knowledge we do share, but my main advocacy with the UN and, and uh, Ottawa is if you, our people can, be the only ones who share indigenous ecological knowledge. 
number one. Um, it needs to become a heritage right. And also, if you want this knowledge, we better see some money behind that. And we run the entire thing. And I actually just finished these massive reviews for these uh, 20, 30 million dollar grants, um, mainly engineers, uh, hydrologists. Uh, if they didn't have a good portion of that money set aside for the indigenous people, their, their grants didn't progress. So it's nice to see that some areas, uh, the TRC is really working. And these are brilliant studies that obviously took a year to put together, brilliant proposals. But if they failed on the indigenous component, they failed because you can't, you can't get one point deducted at that level. Um, so it is, it is becoming quite effective. Um, we're, obviously, there's more work to be done. So we're also doing participatory mapping, and this is something, again, that the uh, knowledge holders wanted. They wanted us to create maps of our land, because if you open Google Maps or any other map, you know, they don't count what we know about the land, how we marked our land, territories, um, what the waterways were called. So everything's done in the language. And I hired Digital Democracy. Um, Rudo Kemper, who would also work with the Amazon conservation team, who I also work with, and they're part of this project. And they did it in the Amazon, and I thought if you guys did it in the Amazon, you could do it here. So they set up the program and the template, and then we train local people, including high school students, on how to populate the map. So I'm going to let them speak for themselves, because um, they're amazing. And they all got uh, university uh, continuing education credits for this work. Our class was certified in water sampling Full by screen. John Smythe, yeah. and we collected data using water related techniques. Seeing all my madness we up there. E. coli samples with swim drift fish. We engaged in tree identification and soil sampling with Gideon and associates with which we filled out with Survey 123. To begin, our class opened the project by laying down tobacco and letting all parts of creation know what we were going to be doing. We also had Miss Asia Ristul General and Alex Hill guide us through Haudenosaunee environmental responsibility. At Six Nations Polytech STEAM Academy, our environmental science class conducted an environmental assessment at Mohawk Park in collaboration with the Enablers Project. For the environmental assessment, our class utilized ArcGIS in a multitude of ways for data collection of the land and water within the Haudenman Tract. The collaborations and data collected were then able to be displayed through the mapping feature in ArcGIS. With Omeganos' help, our class was able to label our maps with the Haudenosaunee languages, pictures, and data. We then took all our information and created story maps to present our project findings. They did an amazing job. I learned a lot in this class. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity that I got. I also learned a lot from this class, but the most part I learned was learning about different types of trees and how many different maple trees there are. At Six Nations Polytechnic STEAM Academy, we utilized a mapping software called Terra Stories. Terra Stories is a geo storytelling application built to map and highlight indigenous and local community knowledge. Terra Stories was accessible to us through the Arneganos project. Community members can add places and stories through a user-friendly interface. We use Terra Stories to map indigenous species of the Grand River watershed. Our base map had a layer of the ultimate deed of 1784, which is a tract of land to the Six Nations that follows the Grand River. Our mission was to fill the map with indigenous species research conducted by the University of Waterloo's Global Engagement Slash Arts 490 students in their Water in the Worlds course. This research would help establish a baseline of ecosystem knowledge for SMP STEAM Academy students to add and include culturally relevant information on the species. Terra Stories will allow staff and students to continue embedding the map with cultural knowledge, indigenous and western science, history, and indigenous language. So they're, they're great. Um, I'm going to turn this down because the next part might be too loud. Um, so the idea for me was 
Oh, Onegonos is gonna. Oh, Onegonos is gonna probably not be funded forever, like any research project. So by uh, putting them in the high schools and working with the teachers, training the teachers, they can continuously upload this living archive and partner with our university folks that they make relationships with, and I'm hoping that it stays as part of our, our legacy. And it's also growing because now um, South Dakota, because we are connected our to South Dakota, Standing Rock, um, the elders from there really like this. They were exposed to it. And I don't know how to get out of this now because it's a full screen. <laughs> um, so they, um, they're doing mapping of sacred sites and um, we're hoping we can do Turtle Island one day. Like I did apply for a $25 million grant. I didn't get it. But the idea was that we would map Turtle Island and people would own your own data. So what, why we like this and why the knowledge holders liked it is you can keep your sacred knowledge uh, under security. There's things that you can release to the public, like water quality data, but there's things that you would not want to keep. And then only certain people, for us, it's faith keepers, would have the right to access that. But it's also a way for us to then, again, be able to engage, because if you want to govern your waters, you need to control the knowledge and information flow of your ecosystem um, before you can like really ha get a handle on <laughs> this governance, uh, everything is not working. Okay, so the Terra Stories um, project overall, you can see the students getting their accreditation and I wanted it to come through engineering. Of course, everybody wanted it to come through indigenous studies. I said, no, these are STEM students. I want them to get it through science. That took two years to negotiate, but we got it. So the goal now is if they get three of these credits, they get one university credit, either in the sciences or in indigenous studies, wherever they want to go. So we also worked with our immersion kids, the Gaiwaneo, who created um, language material and also digital stories. So the health and wellness, the women wanted us to look at the impact of water insecurity on, on uh, babies, new moms and babies. The midwives were saying that um, this is problematic for um, they know a lot of babies are born into homes that don't have water or security or don't have access to clean water and that they see a, a higher elevance of wound care, of skin rashes on babies. So we just wanted to document it. And then of course COVID hit, but the midwives took it over. And of course when the community takes it over, it's like they got 50 interviews in two months. You ask any PhD student, would it have taken them almost two years to get that? And they got the information easily because they got relationships with the women. What we found out of the, um, this study was that not only do they have these higher elevations of wound care issues, but they also have higher anxiety and depression. So mental health became one of the higher um, uh, issues that we weren't really aware to the extent that they existed because of lack of access to clean water. So women were saying they think about water, um, running out of water, not having enough water from the time they wake up, wake up till they go to bed about 10 times a day was the average. So this is causing a lot of anxiety, depression, and we also found uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which I didn't realize when you're out of control of your environment for your most basic needs. Um, it can be a trigger for post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's very impactful to not have access to clean water. And this is just a study, but again, all of this is published and you can find it on our website. So this is Sarah uh, Dugnan, and a, or no, this is a Froze's yet. So this is the birthing center. And as you can see, you know, yeah, we got skin rashes, anemia, and other issues that they identified were related to lack of access to clean water, but anxiety and depression were the highest. Um, I'm gonna, we kind of made that point, so I'm just gonna go over. Um, the health, and because I want to, I want to share a little bit on the on the Cree findings. Um, so we, the VR, I had no idea that this is what they were going to want to do. So they wanted to start with a Sky World story because that's our first teaching about water. When when Sky Woman is in the sky, the very first mention of water. Um, and then we also wanted to house the findings and give kids points. So we're just now working on the gaming app 
application, but I really encourage you to try it. It's truly amazing. Um, the work that's been done on it by students and, and knowledge holders and um, our team. So they are creating knowledge centers. You can go in those knowledge centers. You can learn about the ecosystem, the climate change data. You can learn about the treaties. And the more you learn, the more points you get. So the goal is to empower our young people with knowledge. But because they're young people, the elders thought gaming would be the best way to um, uh, do this. So this is our longhouse, and this is literally my family that I made come out um, because that's when the VR people could come out. And um, and we just want to show some of our dances because all of our dances that we do are about the earth, right? That's where the knowledge is. People say, where's traditional ecological knowledge? It's it's literally in the fiber of our being, so it's really hard to pull out these strands. But it's in our songs, it's in our ceremonies, it's, it's literally embedded in who we are. So all we can do is give little snippets of all the dances we do in Longhouse are about giving thanks for the maple, giving thanks for the strawberries, giving thanks for the harvest. Like It's, it's literally all about ecocentric um, thinking. So if you want to see more of that, you can head back there. I'll show you a little bit, but honestly, I hate it because this is not what it, it really is without As the headset. As she was falling, the lacrosse player came to break her fall. After leaving Skyworld, he transformed into a meteor. He picked her up and carried her down to the Earth's upper atmosphere. And this is an old version. It's, it's actually better um, now. I'm trying to race through this, sorry. Then the geese saw her as she was falling, and they carried her on their wings. It was the great turtle that came to the surface and said to the geese, On my shell, you will place her. All of the water animals came to her. She said to the animals, It is earth that I need to be able to live. The beaver volunteered to die and bring up some earth, and he failed. Then the otter volunteered to die and bring up some earth, and he also fails. It was the muskrat that succeeded in bringing up the earth in his paw for her. As she shuffles on the back of the great turtle, the earth expands rapidly. Sowing the seeds of survival, cultivating the seeds of consciousness, and harvesting the hope for humanity. You'll also be able to do this in Mohawk, Cayuga, or English. So you'll be able to choose. So that's just a little snippet of it. Um, I'm trying to get out of here now. So those are just some highlights. There's so much I left out. Um, I just want to end it with our elder the here. The water has that ability to wash that clean because it's continually moving. It's continually moving. It's taking all of those negative things away. And so that's the value of this idea that <clears throat> the waters are part of our healing. And so it's absolutely essential, essential to keep those waters as pure as we possibly can because it carries all kinds of nutrients. It carries the very life that we share. It goes through our bodies. We're born in water. We came out of the water. And here we are. What a what a wonderful world. What a miracle. So I'm just going to briefly cover a little bit um, of the Lubicon um, uh, findings. But I'm going to ask Emil to do, because uh, this computer is going to die. Um, I'll bring up the Lubicon portion. It's just some Cree work that has been done that I wanted to share. But I want Emil. I want Emil to talk about the sensors and how they designed them with the older people 
The data that we looked at was all about farming and carcinogens and PCBs from farming, but the elders said, no, you need to look for heavy metals. <clears throat> and so that was a challenge. So they're going to talk a little bit about how fun it's been to uh, try to accommodate the expectations of community to create low-cost low sensors that would help us manage our water. So I want to introduce Emil and then Tianu from uh, your from far away, right? <laughs> I haven't really met him. There's so many working on the team. Um, he's been working with Emil, and he's the one that saved the, saved the sensors for us, and he's been working with Makasha and Randy back there. So I'm going to ask Emil to come up while I go look for the cord for this to end it on a Cree note, hopefully. Here you go. So welcome, my name is Emil Sekirinski, I'm from McMaster University. Uh, it's been a pleasure, it's been a pleasure and, uh, and an honor to be here and to be able to address you. I've kind of enjoyed the talks I, I, I listened to so far and hope to, to learn more from the talks in the, in the afternoon then as well. Uh, so, so this is part of this uh, Global Water Futures uh, project and I just uh, introduce you. So this is joint work with my colleague uh, Charles and Alloy from from chemical engineering. Uh, many students have been involved in this work uh, over the years. Uh, uh, Tian Yuzo, kind of, he's here, he's currently working on as well as uh, Eric Frechette, kind of, who does, did some of the work on, uh, on these uh, six nations. Uh, so I'm from the Department of Computing and Software, my colleague Charles from the Chemical Engineering Department. So, developed, so develop, we developed uh, uh, low cost, real time water uh, monitor, monitoring quality uh, solution that consists of these kind of, this is the early design shown in this picture and a test installation. Uh, that uh, consists of such uh, floating devices that are then transmitting wirelessly, uh, wirelessly the water quality, uh, and that can be then then observed. So, so in this installation here, we uh, we are testing for for conductivity, turbidity, pH, uh, uh, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. Depending on what you want to do, one or the other of these, uh, these is then then relevant to indicate the water quality. Uh, we don't have heavy metals sensors, wireless sensors uh, so far, and th this is still, and we don't have uh, uh, some some of the others uh, like like chlorine. Uh, we don't uh, we can't do this uh, so far, but these are the ones that we can do rather uh, rather easily. <laughs> Uh, so, so here is kind of, uh, and this, uh, this solution comes here with an app, uh, with an app on the mobile website. Uh, in fact, we have right now, uh, we have an installation at Six Nations. You can, if you go to this website that is mentioned here, you can check the real-time data uh, uh, as it is being just measured every couple of minutes to see what it uh, goes. So this, uh, this works on the mobile devices as well as on, on desktop devices. And, the, and it shows in, in, in an, in, in an a graphical way and a map uh, where the locations of the sensors are and what the data of the or the history of the data then is. Uh, the data can also be exported for a bit more more thorough analysis. So this is kind of just some pictures showing you the uh, the installation that we have here. Uh, this is uh, Eric uh, uh, wading in the water and uh, installing one of the sensors. And on the right, you see one of these uh, so-called gateways that are then needed to transmit the data. Uh, the way how this works is that the sensors first transmit to the gateway and then the gateway transmits it to the to the servers. So so the test installation was done at the Six Nations of the Grand River. We have now three three locations where we're being monitored now for uh, for two months uh, and where we then check uh, well where we then compare the data with um, 
uh, with some manual data to see how, how well the installation works. Uh, the whole point of this one was to make it really, really low cost uh, and to make it also an educational. So the educational aspect of it uh, uh, was, uh, was also a big part of it. So uh, in this latest design, you saw those pictures of an earlier design. And we have now this latest design, kind of which is just right now here. So this is this thing. Yeah, right. So this is this thing, how, how these uh, sensors now, now work. Uh, it, is <laughs> it is a really low cost design. Uh, this tube here are just... Uh, uh, we got them from Home Depot. These are wastewater tubes uh, and that you can get for a couple of dollars. So, so the, the enclosure is, 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 uh, is very easy to build. Uh, the electronic components, uh, some of them are a bit more expensive. Some of them are uh, very inexpensive. Uh, so, but everything together, something like $220 plus these various sensors and uh, that they can be then installed in them. The sensors are industrial quality sensors. So kind of they are, they're supposed to be rather reliable. So they're industrial quality, uh, quality sensors. Uh, these gateways that we need in order to transmit, uh, they may or may not depend on installation with another $500. And then the server in which you then store the data can either use your existing computer or just uh, get one for roughly, roughly $100. Uh, so uh, hardware and software, everything is open sourced. And we also developed educational material so that can be used in high schools and in other courses in order to show how these systems are being built so that people can take ownership of of building these sensors and, and monitoring their own, their own data then, then as well. I have here some, some more. Uh, so on one occasion, this is shows uh, my colleague Charles and the to the very left, on the left picture kind of, he's, uh, he's explaining how these uh, sensors work and how, what the water quality parameters are to, uh, to a group of students at this uh, STEAM Academy. Uh, we did this, uh, uh, this outreach then in, in the middle of this year. And we also had a classroom activity as well as, uh, as fields activity. Uh, we also did uh, kind of a, as a part of this project turtle tracking in order to be able to protect uh, turtle habitat. Uh, the idea was to first to observe the turtle the, uh, movement in real time. And we built a very uh, rather low cost inexpensive sensors that they also transmit the locations of the turtle. We can mount on the turtle and then transmit, transmit the locations of, of the turtle here. So, kind of, so that is uh, basically uh, the, the, what I wanted to say. We are also now working, as, uh, as Dawn mentioned, integration uh, with, uh, with Terra Stories. We just have uh, now, uh, now some students working then on, on, on those as, uh, as well. Okay, so that, uh, that concludes my part. So if you have any, any questions, what I really would invite you is we have a booth over there where you see the sensors uh, kind of uh, in, a, in a hollow form in a glass enclosure where you can see the inouts, but you also have uh, some, some uh, uh, laptop set up that show you the real time data and and give us some we can we are happy to more than happy to talk to you about this and i'm passing now back then to to don so please if you if you like um they they really would love to show you their sensors um, is there any questions for emil i'm going to try to wrap this up and we don't know if it'll work. Oh, the VR is working. OK, so VR, they got it working. Um, if you want to go try that, I'm just going to, I just want to pay homage, but it, won't, it might not work because it's going to die. Oh, no. Yeah, it's, it's, its power is too low, so it won't, it won't even let me in. So. I will try to see if it powers up enough so that I can open the, um, but I, what I want to talk about with the Cree, we only managed to do the biology study and essentially we found, obviously because they're near the tar sands, um, the water quality is really bad. I go over a bit about, you know, the government metrics, which are not the same as our metrics, especially for boiled water advisory, for mercury for other things that we're finding. Um, so it's a little confusing for community because we're explaining what our metrics are and what the government metrics are. And they wanted to build the sensors based on what our community uh, wanted to see, which is zero mercury in our water. So not 0.3% unless it's organic. So we're also testing fish. We have one of the top mercury specialists in the country, Dr. Karen Kidd testing the fish and then we're also we're to do human health testing but again COVID shut that part down 
um, and then you know PhD students graduate and then you're trying to figure out how you're going to do this work without your 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 main um, uh, folks so we're we're kind of uh, trying to figure out how to finish the project we've got one year left but I think overall we've addressed um, also the mapping uh, I've been looking at pipelines so it's in that one I can't show you, <laughs> um, it's not working. Um, we have a map of all the pipelines in Canada, and of course that's what's affecting Lubicon, but one of my students, I asked her if she could map out the missing and murdered Indigenous women hotspots, and we found a perfect correlation. Um, I just want to add man camps to that because there's some outliers, but I know that territory in northern Alberta really well, and some of the outliers for the hot spots are actually mining communities. So it's, it's not just pipelines, but my, my hope is that we can take this to the United Nations and we can talk about the harm uh, and violence caused to Indigenous women with these pipelines. It's not just about the water and the, and the degradation of our ecosystem. It's about the harm it's causing to the safety and security of Indigenous women and use United Nations law to pursue that. So all I do is give the tools to my community, to Indigenous organizations, grassroots movements, and say, go for it but I'm just collecting the information that they need, which is what all indigenous research should be about, is if it's not going to help our people or be impactful, and it's just somebody's diabetes studies because that's what they wanna study, um, we need to stop that. So I've also been educating the community and saying, you know, if it's not benefiting us, if we're not running it, say no. Uh, if you don't need it, you're not obligated to tell all these researchers yes. Um, unless they're handing you a great portion of being able to do research that we need done in the language, produce language material, do something, right? So I'm just trying to set a standard for ethics and ethical research that should be met not just by me, but by everybody else. So it's been a really interesting process without our stakeholders, uh, Fish and Wildlife, Environment Office, Public Works is amazing because they do it every day. So they've been forming and shaping this research from day one, along with elders and grandmothers. So it's a big, big project, and I can only share like a small portion of it. But I think that, you know, Alberta, like I don't think we should be doing necessarily the research in northern Alberta because they are, our researchers aren't familiar. They don't have a background in this area. But we thought if we at least got some data together to show that maybe people from here, uh, University of Alberta, um, their scientists, their computer engineers would go help the local indigenous populations manage their water, build these metrics, because like they're right here. <laughs> and, and it should be the, the First Nations from here that lead that project. So I'm hoping to see more of our kind of work around the country and that's kind of what we wanted to do is create a model so that hydrologists and other people couldn't say, oh well we don't know how to work with native people, which is what I heard a lot. Um, so we're trying to change that so that these things are more accessible to everybody. But I wanna thank you for hearing us out and I'm really apologetic for not being able to show you the, the, the Cree work. Um, I had a Cree student do a beautiful digital story on water. Maybe we can show it in there over lunch or something. But yeah, I love sharing our, our, our students' work. So Nyawe, thank you. Thank you, Emil. He's willing to talk to everybody. He came all the way from Toronto, uh, flew in, and he's got to fly back right after this because you're getting an award, right? <laughs> so he's getting an award. And Emil's got to fix his house. Some contractors are waiting for him. So um, I apologize for not being in a hangout the entire day, but I really hope to get to the round dance tonight. Yahweh, thank you. Donnie too.